In this next module, I'm going to talk about the issues of ghostwriting and guest authorship. So this has been a hot topic in the last three, four years. It's been covered in a number of articles in the New York Times, uh, and it has had some pretty profound influence on the medical literature. So I want to spend some time um, talking about it. Uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about the medical literature here. This has been a major problem in the medical literature. I'm not sure of the extent to which it, um, it occurs in other scientific disciplines, but certainly for the medical literature, it's been a huge issue of late. So what are we talking about here? So what are ghost authors? So a ghost author is somebody that uh, a company would hire, a, pro a, a professional writer who a company would hire to draft a manuscript. At the end of the day, though, they would not be listed as an author on the manuscript, hence the term ghost authorship. So the company goes out and hires somebody, and it's, you know, I, I'm certainly uh, have nothing against professional writers getting involved in the manuscript writing process. I think that can often be a very good thing. The problem is in the lack of transparency, that the person drafting the manuscript is paid by a drug company, uh, is probably given the message that they're supposed to be um, putting across by the drug company, and yet there's no uh, transparency on that on the final draft. It comes across oftentimes, some of these um, articles are then uh, given a guest or honorary authorship, which I'll talk about in a minute, to make it look like an academic wrote that. And so there's um, all sorts of problems there. Um, the related um, type of authorship is this guest authorship, or sometimes called an honorary author. And this happens when um, a company writes a manuscript, drafts a manuscript, does all the data analysis, kind of makes all the conclusions on their own. After the draft is ready, they contact somebody who's at an academic institution, usually in a kind of a prestigious university, and say, hey, we'd love to make you an author on, uh, on this paper. You know, rem you remember you kind of helped us uh, a little bit with the study design way back when. Well, now we want to make you first author on the paper. And this happens, and I'm going to show you how well documented this is. And um, authors, you know, academic researchers lend their name as an author, often a first author. And it's a, it's a benefit for sort of a tit, -tat for, tit for tat relationship. So it's a benefit for the academic researcher because uh, oftentimes these drug company studies are major clinical trials that get published in major journals. So they, are, they boost the academic researcher's um, academic resume for things like promotion. They also help the drug company because if you kind of try to minimize the involvement of the drug company and make it look like somebody at a prestigious, independent academic institution was the person responsible for the article, that bolsters some credibility to the, to the paper, some sense of that there's an independent person involved. So obviously that um, is misleading. So people have tried to figure out how often does this occur. It's kind of a well-known thing that this has occurred for a, while, uh, of a long time in the medical literature. People have been aware of it and it's just kind of been done. It's been getting a lot more press attention lately um, because of the fact that there's been some major drug trials, some, some court trials involving drug companies, where there's been a lot of internal documents that have um, been opened uh, for viewing because of these court trials, and some interesting things have been found there, and so I think there's just a heightened awareness of this issue. So how often does it occur? Uh, in the latest study in British Medical Journal in 2011, some researchers sent an anonymous survey to the corresponding authors of articles from top medical journals. So these are things like the Annals of Internal Medicine, JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, and they asked them to report in an anonymous survey how often guest or honorary authorship occurred and how often ghostwriting occurred. And so they found that 17.6% of those corresponding authors reported the occurrence of honorary or guest authorship, and 7.6% reported the occurrence of ghost authors. So it's happening, and uh, some of these papers, of course, may have overlapped. So it's happening, though, in about, you know, somewhere around 20% or so of papers. So that's a fairly high percentage, and these, again, are the top medical journals. So it's really uh, quite pervasive. So just to give you an example of, of this, uh, as a case study, there was a paper published in JAMA in 2008 
the researchers had access to a, a whole bunch of internal company documents from Merck because Merck was being sued uh, due to the drug Vioxx, which was pulled off shelves when it was um, learned to increase the risk of heart attack. So uh, the researchers went through a whole bunch of court documents. They found about 250 court documents that were relevant to this issue of authorship. And they um, looked at these company emails and company internal documents that were related to either publishing clinical trials papers or review papers. And what they found was really quite interesting and, and, and shocking. So uh, I'm just going to quote uh, the, the summary that uh, the, the authors wrote in the JAMA paper. So they reviewed uh, 24 clinical trials papers and, and they said this is what they found. Documents were found describing Merck employees working either independently or in collaboration with medical publishing companies to prepare manuscripts and subsequently, subsequently uh, recruiting external academically affiliated investigators to be authors. So this is this whole problem of uh, using uh, honorary or guest authors. Recruited authors were frequently placed in the first and second positions of the authorship list. So again, people really knew that this was occurring, but when we had all of these documents, then you could really kind of track exactly how prevalent and how systematic this was at a company like Merck. And just to give you an idea, um, this is one of the emails that was published in this article. It's from an internal company email where they're writing to a potential guest author and asking them if they'd like to be an author. And it kind of just shows you how blatant this is. So the company writes to the potential guest author, I would like to invite you to be an author on the abstract and manuscript for this study. We are currently preparing both for submission before the end of this year. So obviously the company is already preparing these things and now after the fact, they're asking for this person to be an author in the study. Could you please let me know if you would be interested in authorship on both the abstract and manuscript, one of the two plan publications or none? So it's like, well, authorship is just this, you know, thing that the company has to give out and the, uh, the researcher can choose whether or not they want to be an author on any of these things. So you can see really that this is truly uh, guest authorship. In making your decision, you may want to take into consideration that the results of this study were negative at first glance. So they're saying, hey, you know, to the researcher, you know, you might not want to be on this study because it came out negative. Well, obviously that's not the reason somebody should be an author on a study or not. Um, obviously this researcher was not heavily involved in the analysis and the writing of this paper. So this is a clear case of guest authorship and they turned up a number of, you know, very um, uh, emails like this which made it very obvious what was going on. Uh, even more interesting when they looked at the review papers. Now, uh, review papers um, aren't based on any you know, new data. So what was happening with the review papers is that people that were in marketing in Merck uh, were kind of coming up with a marketing strategy. They were then contracting with medical publishing companies who would ghostwrite the manuscripts. So obviously those publishing companies, those professional writers weren't going to be put as the authors on that manuscript. And then they would go to a, an external academic person and ask them to be the author. So this is a real case where a review article may present a particular opinion or view or perspective. And so they're basically getting a, an outside academic person who has this you know, sense of authority and independence to lend their name to their marketing strategy. And often um, they, these uh, authors were paid honoraria for their participation. So not only did they you know, not write the article and they get to put it on their CV, but they're also being paid to lend their name. And interestingly, only half of these review articles disclose the, the ties to Merck. So that's quite insidious. And you can see that that could have a profound uh, impact on the medical literature. Merck could actually, you know, put this whole set of opinions and perspectives out in the medical literature with it having the, the stamp of, you know, it coming from an academic institution when it really came from the drug company marketing people. So you can see how, why this has been such a, a hot issue. Um, I'll refer you to a couple more articles if you're curious. It's a very, you know, fascinating um, topic. If you're curious to read more, there's been a whole bunch of articles in the New York Times about this, and I'll just quote you uh, from one more, uh, from one of these articles to, again, show this wasn't just Merck. So uh, in another case with Wyeth uh, being sued over hormone replacement therapy, another whole set of court documents came out. And so uh, the New York Times and uh, PLOS Medicine got together and kind of went through uh, these documents. And, and here's the summary. 
The court documents provide a detailed paper trail showing how Wyeth contracted with a medical communications company to outline articles, draft them, and then solicit top physicians to sign their names, even though many of the doctors contributed little or no writing. The documents suggest that the practice went well beyond the case of Wyeth and hormone therapy involving numerous drugs from other pharmaceutical companies. So this is really was a really widespread thing uh, for drug companies. And again, now uh, journal editors are becoming much more aware of it. So it's likely that this practice will change. But as that uh, British Medical Journal article showed, it's still uh, a fairly pervasive in the literature, at least in the medical literature. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.